Good morning. Technically, it's like 45 seconds early, but I'm going to start because everybody's standing around and I feel weird. So, uh, good morning. My name is Chris. Uh, I work for Oculus. This this talk is called uh, "Going for Speed," and it's about developing for this guy, uh, Oculus Go. And I have a couple of things. I guess I should tell you a little bit by myself. Uh, I have a couple of things I want to do in this talk because uh, my role at Oculus is that I'm um, I'm a developer relations engineer, which is um, basically I'm an engineer that helps folks like yourselves to ship on Oculus platforms. We help with optimization, help with game design, whatever. whatever. Um, they make me take a picture that I don't like very much, and so I had to use it somehow and zoom in real close. And I'm going to talk about Oculus Go today as like a, how to develop for Oculus Go, particularly with an eye towards performance, particularly with an eye towards building a Unity project that is built around sort of the strengths and weaknesses of mobile chipset that's in Oculus Go. Uh, but I also have a second life uh, as a game developer. I recently shipped my 20th commercial title. Uh, and these days, I only, I only moonlight on game development. Oculus this is really my full-time job. Uh, but I thought, you know, this is Unite, and uh, I should be talking about a real project and rather than these, these topics in the abstract. So I'm going to talk about the, the game that I most recently shipped, which is called Dead Secret Circle. Uh, and this is a title that my team, mostly my team and a little bit of me, mostly my team, uh, built in Unity originally 5.6. These days it's running on 2017. Uh, and it, does, it was shipped for Oculus Go along with a number of other uh, titles. So what I want to do today is sort of take this uh, project and sort of pull it apart and show you some of the tricks and tips that we pulled specifically for Oculus Go, uh, sort of in the context of you know, you know, what this hardware is good at. Not everything in this talk will be applicable to all projects, but I kind of wanted to show you how we went about this because I think actually a lot of the concepts are applicable. And maybe uh, we went a little bit of extreme on the, the way that we set our project up in order to reach maximum performance, um, but it, it worked out quite well. So, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'll tell you a little bit about Dead Secret Circle. Um, it's a team of three and a half. I'm the, the half. Mainly my job these days is to paw through the code late at night and introduce bugs. Uh, this is a 14-month development cycle, and it's kind of a you know, mystery horror game. You, you walk through this apartment where there's a, there's a murderer lurking somewhere, and you've got to figure out which of the characters is probably the bad guy, and you know, interview them, and solve puzzles, and... and Examine rooms and try not to get killed yourself. Our challenge was to make this run fast. It's a pretty big game. It's four to eight hours of, of gameplay. Uh, and, and you'll see what it looks like. The, our challenge is to make this run fast on Oculus Go. So Oculus Go is, is this three degrees of freedom headset that we just shipped. Um, it's pretty good, I think. <laughs> it's a... Uh, it's an all-in-one virtual reality headset. So all the compute's built in. There's no wires. There's no computer. There's no phone that you need to, to run the device. Your, your compute's all in here. Your apps are all installed in here. You put this thing on your head, and you, and you go. It comes with the controller. This thing, it's a three degrees of freedom controller, which means it gives you orientation information, but not positional information. Uh, it has a trackpad and a click and a trigger. This guy has a super high-res screen as you can see, uh, and also it's running a Snapdragon 821, which is a, you know, a fairly common class of mobile chipset for, uh, for phones. It's, it's similar to the chip that uh, Samsung uses in the Galaxy S7. The challenge with making high-performance software on a mobile VR platform like Go is that basically you're running against a mobile CPU, GPU, which are really, actually, they're quite powerful these days, but they're still an order of magnitude off of what you would expect from like a console or, or a PC. And you've got this really high-res display. In fact, the display is significantly higher res than you see on a console or a PC. Uh, in VR, performance is mandatory. You cannot drop below 60 frames a second uh, because your, your customers will get sick if they do, if you do. Uh, you know, on other platforms, if you need to drop down to 30 for a little while, I mean, like, it's probably okay depending on the type of game you're building, but not in VR. You have to basically hold good frame rate all the time. A little bit of fluctuation will be all right, but if you start falling down, uh, or if you have a big spike that lasts for a while, it's going to feel bad. And also, you have two eyeballs. Uh, your customers also have two eyeballs. 
Uh, that means you have to render the scene twice, right? Once to the left eye, once to the right eye. So these are pretty significant uh, hurdles to performance because they all, they all incur a pretty significant performance penalty right out of the gate. Working with developers and, and shipping my own games on these type of devices, I think that the place where most applications fall down is in, there's two areas. One on the CPU side is, is draw calls. And the other on the GPU side, it's actually filling the pixels. And I'm gonna talk in depth about both of these topics today. I could just tell you like what the solutions are. That's easy, right? Like, hey, just do these things and everything will be fine. You can reduce your draw calls, you can reduce your pixel fill. Um, I think this is a less useful slide because it's easy to say these things and it's actually hard to set up your Unity project in a way that, that does these sort of from the ground up. So let's talk about implementation. I'm gonna start with draw calls. Uh, so everybody in this room has probably dealt with draw calls, but how many people know what a draw call is? That's pretty good, pretty good. All right, so a draw call is a command to the GPU to draw mesh. Your, your, your game engine, Unity is saying, hey, I wanna draw this table or this chair or something. And in doing so, it actually has to submit some information. It has to submit the, the vertices itself, has to submit a texture or any other arguments to the shader, it has to submit the shader program. And then the driver has to do a bunch of work. The driver has to take all that state that's been submitted and it has to match it to the vertex stream. So um, like for example, the uniforms in your shader have to match up to your vertex stream somehow. And basically there's some, some format conversions and stuff that happen in the driver at that point before it goes down to the GPU. And that's why draw calls are essentially a CPU cost is because you're spending time on the CPU to format this data on its way down to the GPU. Uh, and when we talk about optimizing draw calls, what we're actually trying to do is reduce the total number of draw calls in the scene so that we have fewer times that we spend the cost to set the state, or alternatively, try to set the state once and then share it across as many draw calls as we possibly can. Because once the state's been set, subsequent draw calls are actually pretty cheap. So if you look, this is a screenshot from the frame debugger. Who is not, anybody in the room not using the frame debugger? Good, the frame debugger is like the best part of Unity 5. I really like it. Uh, if, even if you're not optimizing for draw calls, you should be looking at the frame debugger and understand how Unity puts your scene together. But I have two different shots of this frame debugger here. One is the, on the left is a basically an unoptimized scene and on the right it's, it's, it's post-optimization. And you can see on the left side, you know, it's basically just draw an object, draw an object, draw an object, draw an object. It's all independent draw calls. And there's a 419 of them, which is a lot. On the right side, it's actually rendering the same scene. The output is exactly the same, but we're down to 32 draw calls, and that's because we have these static batches in there. And basically what that means is Unity's been able to take a bunch of our mesh, a bunch of our objects, and stick them together into a single big mesh, bind that, bind its state just one time, and then draw a bunch of little objects out of it. Uh, that's significantly faster. So how do we do this? How do we accomplish that sort of efficient batching. Uh, well, the first thing we want to do is in VR, there's a setting called single pass stereo rendering. Uh, single pass stereo rendering is also called multi-view outside of Unity land. Uh, it's an OpenGL ES extension built uh, specifically for mobile VR sort of use cases. Uh, but what it does is it allows you to issue a single draw call and render both in the left and the right eye at once. And that's great because back in the day in like 2016, uh, you had to render the whole left eye and then the whole right eye. And so basically all of your draw calls are duplicated. You know, draw, 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 draw. So whatever number you saw in the editor, like in your statistics pane, would be half of what you actually had to, to issue. These days, we don't have to do that anymore. We can use single pass stereo rendering and actually just render the, the draw calls required for the scene and actually output two eyes. So this is, a, this is a basically a free optimization you should turn on. If you don't, you're gonna be pretty sad. Um, so the next thing is we want to actually prepare our, our scene content to make it easy for Unity to batch. Unity will do a really good job of taking uh, all of our objects in the scene and sort of putting them together into a small number of draw calls as long as we ensure that we followed certain rules. And there's a basically that we don't want to change state in the middle of drawing the frame, which means one material per mesh, first of all. If your meshes have more than one material, they're not batchable because by definition, in the middle of drawing, you have to switch the state, right? You draw with your first material, change material and draw it again. You've just broken batching. Uh, Unity's not gonna batch things that aren't matched as static. There is dynamic batching, which I'm not gonna talk about today, which is you know, good for small things, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking about large scale static batching of the scene today. Uh, that means these objects can't move. 
They can still be turned on and turned off. You can adjust their visibility, but you can't move them. And you need to make sure that they're, they're checked as static in the editor, right? Uh, and then what we want, the, this is the, probably the most critical and most difficult piece, is we want a shared material for all of the meshes, or for a very large group of meshes. And shared material means the shared material instance, like the pointer to your material has to be the same across all of these objects. It can't just be like an instance of the same material or they won't batch. So for example, if you call renderer.material in your code, that the first time you do that, it actually instances the material object. It, it allocates a new material and gives it back to you. And now you've broken batching because you just changed the pointer that's associated with, the, uh, with this particular mesh. Having a shared material also implies that we have the same shader and the same texture for all of these objects, which is actually kind of a strict requirement. Uh, we, we basically want to bake our lighting. Baked lighting can be batched really efficiently as long as we set it up properly, and I'll talk about how we did that in Dead Secret Circle. But uh, we want to ensure that we're not using per-pixel lighting as much as we can, because when we're trying to batch things, per-pixel lighting will break the batch. Essentially, per-pixel lights need multiple passes. Multiple passes equals changing state in the middle of the draw, which means breaking the batch. Doesn't mean that per-pixel lights are off limits. Just means that when you're trying to optimize for batching, it's something to watch out for. And then occlusion culling is sort of a general purpose technology, uh, which we'll talk about in detail today, which is about not drawing things you can't see. So like if I can't see past this, this cool uh, wall that's made out of a, a piece of cloth back there, then I shouldn't actually issue any draw calls for the things that are past it. Even if I did try to draw stuff that's on the other side of that wall, it wouldn't show up because it would be z-tested away. And on a PC or on a console, that might be, that might be fine because we don't see it anyway. Uh, but on a, on a mobile device like Oculus Go, you don't actually want to spend the cost for those draw calls. You want to figure out that you can't see that object ahead of time and then, and then kill it before you even get to the point of issuing the draw call. So let's talk about Dead Secret. Uh, this is a scene from the game that basically, before any optimization is applied, there's no lighting here yet. Uh, this is basically the most unoptimized version of this scene. Uh, the artist, you know, makes these objects exports them as, as FBXs, they get pulled in, the designer clicks them together and makes this apartment. And if we zoom in on the, on the statistics here, you can see that we're at 234 draw calls for this particular scene. Uh, on Oculus Go, we're trying to target like 150 draw calls max. If we can get it down to 100, that'd be even better. These aren't strict requirements. These are more of like a rule of thumb because as I said, like the actual Computing the actual cost of a draw call has to do with how often you change state and not necessarily the total number of calls. But generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, 150 is not a bad upper bound. Uh, so we're, we're pretty above, pretty high above that right now at 234. So the reason that we have 234 draw calls is that all the textures for all the objects in this scene are unique. You know, I've got a chair texture, and I've got a, a, a texture for the pillow that is on the, the couch, and I've got a texture for the light, and a texture for the walls, and the, you know, the artist has built it this way, right? They've, they've made the art. Um, our art director, Robot Invader, is named Mike. He builds almost all of the art. He builds the art, and he submits, you know, he gives me a nice 512 by 512 texture along with the mesh, and it looks great in the game, but now it doesn't batch because all of the textures are separate. Uh, so the, the solution to this, the, the usual solution is to atlas our textures, which is to say, like, take all of the textures in the scene, click them together into some giant big texture, and then modify the mesh to point into that big texture instead of having its own little texture. Uh, and, and in previous games, we did this by hand. Like, I actually forced Mike, the artist, to make his atlas textures and do the UVing himself. Uh, and that works, and it and is effective at, at making your batching faster, but it's a pain in the butt for the artist. And also, it makes it so that um, you can't really move your objects around, right? Once you have textured your objects to an atlas texture, by definition, they're sort of tied to the objects that are also in that atlas texture. So if I want to take this light and put it in some other completely different part of the game, uh, it's going to bring this giant texture with it because it happens to be some little tiny piece of this texture. So for this game, we wanted to do better. And what we did is we built a, a level processing pipeline uh, that automatically atlases all of the textures in the scene. So it, it starts with a scene that looks like the one I just showed you, which is essentially the the normal sort of unoptimized version with a bunch of individual textures. And, uh, you know, kind of hit a button. It's an editor script. And it creates a new scene. It just basically copies the scene into a new file, sets that as the current scene, and then goes through all of the mesh and, and adjusts the, the UVs to point into this new texture and generates an atlas texture out of the specific textures that are in that scene. 
So we end up with uh, you know, a new scene that has a single texture that looks like this. If I can't fit it into 14096, it might generate multiple textures, but you, you can get the idea, right? Uh, the, the algorithm, by the way, for packing textures is not very complicated. I didn't know it. I looked it up on the internet. Um, Unity also provides a texture packer uh, API. I had some, some complaints with the way the Unities work, so I wrote my own, but you could, you could do this anyway. If you're going to write this pipeline, it's actually not that complicated. Uh, then the next thing we do, once we, have, once we have our scene that has been generated with these Atlas textures, is we want to bake the lights, and we want to bake the lights into as few light maps as possible. And Oculus Go has a lot of memory and a lot of texture bandwidth, so we're going to bake into these really giant, uh, this is a 4096 by 4096 light map. Uh, and the reason is that I want to change light maps as infrequently as possible. Light maps are like a secret argument to your shader. There's actually a light map index in your renderer that you can look up. And when you render with like a Unity surface shader, that index is implicitly passed to, as an argument to the shader. So if, you're, if your light map changes, for example, you've got multiple light maps in the scene, uh, and you need to switch light maps in the middle of drawing the scene in order to, in order to draw the next object, you're going to break batching because that light map index is one of the things that is, is different between your, your, your meshes. So we want to ideally have a single light map for the entire scene, or uh, if we can, it's just as few as possible. So we render these really massive light maps. It takes forever. Once we've done that, you need to do a really good job of making everything static, or I'm sorry, putting everything together into a big old combined mesh as long as we've marked it static. So basically with those two things, like the being careful about the light mapping and then atlasing our textures and marking our objects static, we're able to get Unity to sort of produce a scene uh, or sort of a collection of mesh that's, that's quite efficient. Uh, and if I go back to the scene, you know, now you can tell it looks better. It's got lights, it's got shadows, it looks, looks like a proper game scene. Uh, and also, it's a lot simpler. We're down to 32 draw calls from 230. Um, this is our basic approach. This is the approach that I decided upon for this game to try to have a level, have like a level asset creation pipeline that wasn't really hard on the artist, but also generate uh, levels that were, were quite efficient for, for the target hardware. You don't necessarily have to build this like, whole level pipeline like this. I mean, there are other tools out there that would help you do things like this. Like, uh, for example, I've used one called MeshBaker, which is, a, which is an asset store uh, tool that you can buy, and it'll atlas your textures, and it'll jam your mesh together. One of the, things that, um, the, one of the reasons I didn't do that is I actually want to continue to use frustum culling as a way to cut vertices out of my scene. So one of the common sort of mesh baker approaches is to say, well, I've got these like five objects and they're all made with different textures and I just want to bake them down into one big thing. I could take this whole room and bake it down into one giant mesh. Uh, and it would do the atlasing for me and it would come up with something that's maybe, you know, one draw call to execute. The problem with that is that that, that object, that whole room is going to have this big bounding box and it's almost always going to be in the frustum, partially because you're going to be standing in the middle of it for half the time. And that means all those verts are going to be submitted to the GPU every frame, whether or not you can see any of it. What I like about Unity's static batching system, instead of, instead of sort of, you know, actually baking the verts together into a big mesh, uh, is that it can actually draw subsets of its big mesh without drawing the whole thing. So if I want to draw these windows, so I'm looking at the windows, then I can draw them out of that big mesh. But if I turn away and look away from the windows, you know, the, the, the vertex buffer that, that Unity generated will still be bound, but those particular windows, you know, they won't, they won't be drawn. So this seemed pretty good. It seemed like I had the right idea. I made our apartment look pretty good. Uh, you know, and then we started looking at more complicated scenes. So this is a hallway. It doesn't look complicated. This is, again, it's before lighting. It's before any optimization. It's basically straight out of the art tool. Um, it doesn't look complicated, but it's like 2,800 draw calls. And I was like, I don't know what's going on with this hallway. Why is this 2,800 draw calls? But then I was like, yeah, I got a button for this now. I'm going to hit the button and like, fix it. And so like, it did all its thing. And Atlas the textures, and it, it lit everything. And I came back three days later, and lighting was complete. Uh, and it was down, hooray, to 500 draw calls, 600 almost. Uh, see, look, we saved 2,000 draw calls by batching. Woohoo! Except that my limit is like 150, right? So, I mean, what the heck? This is a hallway with like some junk at the end of it. Why is it 600 draw calls? 
The answer is this is actually part of a massive level. Uh, this level is so huge I can't really tumble around it in the in the editor with at, at frame rate. Um, it's it's this, it's the whole apartment. This is the entire like most of the game takes place in this level. And then for this particular moment in the game, you can go to any of these rooms, and so they're all loaded. And what's happening is we're sitting at the bottom of this hallway on the first floor, and the frustum doesn't know where walls are, so the frustum is basically just extending out through whatever walls we have and picking up any objects that might fall within it and deciding to render them. And we don't see them because they get z-tested away at the at the end of the pipe. But at the beginning of the pipe, we're still issuing draw calls for them, and that's why there's 600 freaking draw calls. So, so this is what occlusion calling is for, right? In theory, we should be able to apply an occlusion calling system, which will go through the whole scene and figure out like what you can see from any given point. In fact, technically speaking, uh, if you've worked on this type of system before, most of these are potential visibility set systems, or PVS. That's uh, you know from this point in space, here's the things that I can potentially see, and so I'm going to include in the set of things that I might draw. Whereas the stuff that's like on the other side of the wall, like I probably can't see, so I'm just not going to include those. Unity has one built in. Uh, it's based on a technology called Umbra, which has been around for a long time and is a very well well known technology. So my first approach was to you know go to the little window and go to the occlusion calling tab and pull that up and hit hit bake and see what happens. Um, and, and, you know, the result was, like, the, the render looks the same, like, the scene looks the same, but there are fewer draw calls, right? There's 451 now. So it, it did a pretty good job of, uh, of cutting some draw calls out, but nowhere near what I actually expect it to do. This could probably be improved by tuning the values that you get with uh, the occlusion calling interface that, that Unity provides. But it's pretty tricky, actually, because it's quite difficult to debug when occlusion calling fails. Like, if it works great for you, like, if you look at the sample scenes that Unity ships, there are scenes for which the system works great. And you can, you can drop it in there, and you can turn it on, and it's like, wow, you just cut out all of your geometry, and everything's super fast, and you move the camera around, and it just works great. Uh, if it doesn't work great the first time, which in my experience, particularly if you're inside a room, like, like with boxes, you know, walls on all four sides, uh, tends to be harder for it to deal with, it's hard to debug. It's hard to understand, like, if you set up the, the settings incorrectly, or if you have, uh, you know, you know, your meshes are not properly built, or you've got some little hole you don't know about. And the challenge is, as you increase the granularity of the occlusion calling, you're also increasing the CPU time at runtime that it requires to compute what's visible and what's not. Um, and then that kind of sucks, right? Because now you're now you're either trading CPU time to issue draw calls for CPU time to figure out which draw calls you shouldn't issue. It's not great. So rather than trying to figure this out after we tweaked it for a month or two, I just gave up and, and wrote my own. Um, it's pretty easy to write an easy, a simple occlusion calling system. In fact, the most common ones are just portal systems where you say, this is a room, when the room is visible, everything in it's visible. This is a hall, when the hall is visible, everything in its room is visible. I wanted to go a step further than that because we have a lot of spaces that aren't, aren't exactly rooms, but they, you know, they occlude things, but they don't have doors, for example. So what I did is I, I made a system where you set cells up in the world, and I go to each of those cells, and I compute what you can see from that cell. And what I mean when I say what you can see is it's really just a list of mesh renderers. What I get out of that is just a list of the meshes that are visible from this scene, and I just, just assign it to the cell. And at runtime, I just figure out which cell the camera's in, and then I'm like, oh, you're in that cell? Okay, the following things are, ena are enabled, and all other mesh is disabled. And that's the occlusion calling system. The tricky part uh, of this is actually deciding what is visible from a given point in a cell. Uh, and there are a lot of different ways to do that. I'll tell you my, my solution. Uh, my solution was to render panoramas from inside the cell using a replacement shader that tints all the mesh a unique color. So basically, I go through the entire scene. I assign a unique color to, uh, to all the meshes. They are stored in some lookup dictionary somewhere, so I know what they are. I render a panorama, and then I can walk the pixels from this output image and do a reverse lookup of the color to find the objects I could actually see. So I'm like, oh, magenta is the crown molding. I see there's a magenta color here. That's crown molding dot mesh. Add that to the list. And like, oh, the little, little blue is the transparent door window. OK, I know what that is. Add that to the mesh. Um, What's cool about this is it's pixel perfect, right? It can only, it'll only include the things that you can see. 
I ended up doing a panorama, which is just why it looks real weird. I mean, it's not made for human consumption. It's just an algorithm that goes and looks at it. But a panorama rather than like a cube map, because a cube map will give you the same pixel density for both the floor and the, and the ceiling, as well as, you know, sort of the XZ plane. And generally speaking, I don't have anything on the floor and the ceiling. It's like a floor or a ceiling where all of the stuff that happens kind of happens right out here. So I wanted more pixel density in here, and so I use this panorama instead of a instead of a instead of a cube map. Uh, and rendering a panorama like this is a junky panorama. It doesn't matter for the algorithm. I just sort of render a slice, move the camera, render a slice, move the camera, render a slice. Uh, you know, in order to make this work, it turns out the designer has to go through the world and like lay out these cells, uh, and it and it means that we want you know, different granularity of cells for different areas. The, the granularity of the occlusion culling, like its, its accuracy at any given moment is a function of the size of the cell. So as, as you are in space, you know, in a VR headset, you can move your head, even on this device, even though it's only three degrees of freedom, uh, we, we provide a little bit of a neck model. So when you tilt your head, you know, the, the actual position of your head moves only slightly. Uh, so you don't really control the camera any longer which means that, that you, you may need to make some areas more, more precise than other areas because the player can basically go wherever they want. Uh, and particularly when I use this on like a Rift or a, a Six Degrees of Freedom headset, you know, the player can really go wherever they want. So the, there's some interface. The, the designer goes in and, and lays out these cells, uh, subdivides them, in whatever way he thinks is most important. Generally speaking, there's, again, less resolution up and down and more resolution in the XZ plane because that's where stuff tends to live. Uh, and then at runtime, it's order one to find what uh, cell the camera's in because it's just some division based on the size of the cells. Okay, so we do all this junk. Uh, and now we have the same scene. It looks the same, but hooray, 54 draw calls. Uh, and if we go look at the actual seen in the editor, we can see what's been turned on. And it's really just this hallway that you can see, right? This is the same level that I showed you a minute ago with had 20 zillion objects that I couldn't tumble around. Uh, now we've turned almost all of those off and we're just looking at the hallway that we happen to be in right now. And that's the output of this algorithm. Whether you use this algorithm or use any others, like PVS is a very well-researched topic. There's a lot of other ways to do it. My particular approach has some drawbacks as well. What I liked about it was that it was order one lookup at runtime uh, and that I could compute all this stuff offline. But there's some, every once in a while, you'll come around a quarter and see a little pop. You know, there's some, there's some drawbacks as well. The main message that I wanted to leave with you is that if you, uh, if you don't do this stuff, you could end up issuing a lot of draw calls that you didn't intend to issue. I mentioned earlier that we had built this sort of uh, level processing pipeline to do the Atlas texturing. I realized that I could just build this occlusion computation straight into that level processing pipeline. So now it takes, it takes the you know, source scene, it stitches all of the mesh together with an atlas texture, it bakes the lights, and then the last stage is it'll actually compute the occlusion. And once we did that, I figured out that we could actually change our, our level creation workflow really significantly uh, by using multi-scene editing. Does anybody use multi-scene editing for anything? A couple people? Yeah, it's like not a super well-known feature and it has a lot of drawbacks. So it's, when I first read about it, I was not sure why you would use multi-scene editing. Basically, since Unity 5, you can open up multiple scenes at the same time and they, they're all open together and all the objects are in the same shared space. There's a lot of like side effects though, like nav meshes can't cross scene boundaries and light mapping doesn't work. And I don't know, there's some, there's some issues with it, right? But I realized if we use multi-scene uh, editing, we could actually treat our scenes like Photoshop layers and we could stack them stack them on top of each other. So we have a layer that's like the base geometry. And then we might have a layer that's like the lights. And the reason that we would do that is that we might have two versions of this level. We might have one at daytime and one at the nighttime. And all my lights are going to be baked anyway. So if I have a, the, the you know, base geometry and I just swap out the scene that describes the lights, I can actually produce two different you know, variants of that level with different lighting. We can even do this with logic. We can put our character in there as a scene. We have multiple multiple characters that you can play as at this game. And, and basically what happens is you start with a whole bunch of scenes that are, are managed independently, and then the tool can sort of bake them down into a single scene. And when I say bake them down, all it does is like copies the game objects. It's a really simple script. We call this a composite scene because now what we have is we have a level 
that's built out of a combination of a bunch of independent scenes, and they're all stacked on top of each other uh, like, like Photoshop layers. And what's cool about this system is because we bake it all down to a single scene uh, at the end of this, of this process, we don't have any of the drawbacks of multi-scene editing. Like our nav meshes aren't a problem because at the end of the day, the nav meshes are gonna get computed against this single monolithic scene. The other thing that's good about this is, you know, one of the, one of the challenges for a mobile device is, is loading data. Like we have a lot of memory available, but loading data can take a while. So with this system, I can actually uh, create versions of the level that only include the areas that you can actually access at that moment. So this is a, that same giant level, but now almost all of the rooms have been turned off. There's only three or four rooms that are available, a couple of hallways that are available. You can see there's doors in the hallways that don't go anywhere. That's because at this stage in the game, you can only go in a couple of places. And we know you can only go in a couple of places. So what we do is we just happen to combine the scenes that make up the places you can go and bake that down into this sort of generated scene at the end. And that means we only load the stuff that you can possibly see rather than loading that massive scene every time. This also helps our, our, our light bake time a little bit because we're, you know, we're not baking lights uh, for areas you can't go. So here's what, our, here's what our level pipeline sort of looks like at the end here, right? We start with these series of scenes that are stacked up each other. We sort of smash them down into a single composite scene. Then from there, we compute an atlas texture. Uh, you know, we, we do the light mapping, we do the occlusion culling, uh, and we end up with something that's super duper efficient. Super duper efficient, and it's designed, you know, for that exact stage of the game. Uh, this, this game, you know, you, you spend a lot of time going back and forth between your own, your protagonist's apartment and this, this sort of apartment complex where we believe that the killer is hiding out. Uh, and each time you go back to that apartment complex, it's actually loading a different composited scene that has different things included with it. I say that one major drawback to this approach, I've been very happy with it, and I will do this again for all of the, the next games I do. The main major drawback to this is our light mapping times get stupid. Um, and the reason is that, first of all, light mapping is just you know, generally slow, and I'm really, really looking forward to being able to do this stuff on the GPU someday. Um, but also, because we're generating mesh based on our Atlas texturing system, basically the, the, the instances of the mesh in each of these scenes are unique, which means we don't actually use any of the light mapper cache. But like the light mapper cache expects the, the instance IDs of the, of the mesh to be the same from bake to bake, and that's actually not true. So every time we go to bake a, a new level, it's essentially like we're baking with, with no cache. And so our light mapping times are, are quite terrible. It takes like a week to bake the entire game. Um, I think that we probably could have solved that if we had realized how poor it was going to be by organizing, like by putting light mapping at a slightly different part of this chain, like maybe putting it up before we combine all the scenes. Maybe we could bake just the pieces that are the, uh, that are the geometry and then layer in the, the, the logic and the occlusion later. Then we would have had to do fewer total bakes. Uh, basically, I want GPU light mapping. Okay, so... The result of all that is we're not drawing as much as, as we sh were before. We're only drawing what we can see, and the things that we're drawing are all batched together, and they're all uh, very, very efficient on this device. So I'm way under my target of 150 draw calls in the average case. I'm like at 50 or something. So let's talk about the next problem. We've, the CPU is fine now. CPU is going to be great. We're not going to be bound on the CPU. Next problem is we could be bound on the GPU. Uh, and, and specifically, I'm talking about the, the cost of fill pixels. And what I mean by that is, like, if I take a look at this scene, and this dude has a skull painting up in his corner, because the corner of his room, because he's he's weirdo. Uh, I zoom in on that. You know, the the cost of this particular pixel right there is essentially computed by the 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 time it took to execute the fragment shader times the number of fragment shaders it had to execute to to fill this scene or to fill this pixel rather, right? So we're going to write all the pixels out to the frame buffer. I'm going to write them a certain number of times. This case, it's basically just a diffuse object. It's, it's, you know, the lighting is baked in. It probably only got written one time. It probably only got written by a very simple shader. But, for example, if I had a transparent object, like some smoke or something, that was in front of this guy, it might be fill written more than once. Maybe we write it once for the, uh, 
for the sort of base color, and then we have to blend over it again for a transparent layer. And if it's a smoke particle effect, maybe there's three or four transparent layers that are on top of it, so we're going to blend again and again. Or if I'd done real-time lighting, you know, we probably would end up blending this pixel multiple times, or specular, or things like that. Anything that would, would uh, require multiple passes over the pixel is going to incur a cost, both to sort of compute the fragment shader, whatever it is that's in your, in your fragment shader, uh, and also the, to just write it back. The reason this matters, I mean, this matters on other platforms too, right? This is the area that PC games, I think, get, get hit with pretty hard, um, is that we are rendering a crap ton of pixels. Like, between our left and our right eye, Dead Secret Circle renders to 1280 by 1280 eye buffers, which means it's rendering to these square textures that are 1280 by 1280 each, and there's two, one for the left and one for the right eye. That's like 3.6 million pixels. Uh, per frame at 60 frames a second. And it is, that's way higher res than your TV. So we're, we're, the reason that we care about fill cost is not because like mobile GPUs are slow. It's because we're filling a huge number of pixels. So how do we fix this? Uh, you know, the first step is that we need to ensure that our fragment shader is simple. I usually start with mobile diffuse. It's like the simplest possible surface shader you could write. Uh, and then I start adding features from there. If you didn't know, uh, you can download Unity's shader source from their website, and it's a super useful resource. Whether you're writing your own shaders or not, I highly recommend uh, just sort of getting in there and seeing how like Mobile Diffuse is implemented. But also, if you're going to go this path, you can just take the code from Mobile Diffuse and copy and paste it and make your own shader and start, start working from there. Uh, we don't use any post effects. We don't use any full screen effects at all. No bloom, uh, no tone mapping, no image effects at all. And because those are, those are usually implemented as a full screen copy, right? You usually render out your eye buffer or your, your frame, and then you copy it to a different frame. And in the process of doing that, you run some, some, uh, some shader and you touch all the pixels. And that means you've, you've just touched all the pixels in your, in your game twice. It's not impossible to do. It's just really expensive. So most folks, including myself, you know, choose not to, not to make the trade-off for, you know, for tone mapping or whatever it is that you would get out of this. Similarly, we can't really deal, or we, we want to try to avoid multi-pass effects. Those are things that touch pixels multiple times for whatever reason. Shadows, uh, you know, any, like specular, the old, old school specular in Unity will, will render the diffuse once and then it'll render the specular portion. It's two passes and so you touch all those pixels twice. And by the way, two passes will break your batching. Um, Per pixel lighting, we can't. We, we actually have per pixel lighting in this game, but it's only in in specific areas because uh, basically those pixels are going to be are going to be rendered for for each of the lights that touch them. And we really, really want to avoid fragment discard. Uh, this is actually something that's specific to mobile GPUs that a lot of folks may not realize. Uh, but but you know, in the middle of your pixel shader, you can like give up. You can say like, I'm in the middle of shading this pixel, but you know what? I don't actually want this pixel at all. Discard it. The other ways you could do this are like with alpha, alpha test or using the clip. All of those are, are essentially going to cause the pixel to get thrown away. This is a bad idea on mobile GPUs because the way mobile GPUs work, particularly the one in, in Oculus Go, is that they, they take your scene and they cut it up into tiles. These are called a tile GPU. They cut it up into tiles. They subsort the geometry into those tiles, and then they render only the triangles that they know you can see for all your opaque geometry. If, in the middle of doing that, you break the rules by saying, you know what, I don't want this pixel, all of a sudden that triangle can't be considered opaque anymore. And that means the sorting results that the GPU's already done for that tile are now invalid. So you just flush that entire tile and it has to start over again and resort with the assumption that that thing's transparent or something. It's really slow. So you basically don't ever want to discard uh, in any way in your fragment shader. This doesn't mean you can't do cool effects, though. It just means you have to author them in a particular way into your shader. I'll show you this. This is the effect that we built for, for Dead Secret Circle. This is like a dream mode effect. Um, and as the idea is, as you're walking around in the space, sometimes when you're back there, it's like it's in a dream. And uh, as you approach objects, they sort of come together after being sort of blown apart, right? This is implemented entirely in the shader. This doesn't use any full screen effects. I don't even change the shader. Uh, from, the, from the basic one, because I'm trying to maintain my, my batching quality, right? Instead, what we do is we set up, we, I said earlier that I set the entire scene up to use the same material, which means I had to use the same shader. 
I set up that basic shader to most of the time be pretty much just mobile diffuse, but also have these sort of hooks that I can turn on that change its behavior without actually changing the materials themselves. And those are, those are implemented with, with uh, shader keywords. So shader keywords in Unity look like if defs in your code. You can go in and say like, hey, if this thing is valid right now, then run this code. And if it's not, then don't. And there's a, you can actually change these globally with this enable keyword command on the, on the shader object. What Unity actually does under the hood is it generates two copies of your shader, one with the stuff turned on and one of them with turned off. And when you toggle the keyword, it just changes which of the shaders is selected. But basically, this is the implementation of this dream effect is in here somewhere. The important parts are like when dream is turned on, uh, it'll compute some displacement or something. And when, it, when it's not, none of that code will run. So without modifying the shader, without modifying any of the materials, without changing anything related to how the scene is actually executed, I can significantly change the way that it's rendered. Uh, this also works for things that you would use full screen effects for, like I have this x-ray effect. Uh, you know, probably in a traditional uh, game on another platform, you would just implement this with like a, an x-ray image effect where you'd render out the entire scene at normal color and then you'd apply this image effect that would invert the colors. But we don't do it that way because it's really expensive on mobile. So we do this in the shader itself. And this is just another if def. Uh, in the code that says, oh, hey, if you've got the cool goggles that let you see into the spirit world turned on, uh, then I'm going to modify the, the color of the fragment on its way out. And you can actually see if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, you know, in the, in the scene, you can actually see that it's not an effect that's applied over the top of the output. It's actually changed the shader in the scene. There's some limitations to this approach. Um, one of the main limitations is you can't if def like if you use if you're using surface shaders, which I use, I use surface shaders for just about everything. If uh, if you're using surface shaders, you can't if def the surface shader definition itself. So for example, uh, I want to make a shader that's real time lit, and I want to make a version of it that's not real time lit, and I'm going to use surface shaders. Those are essentially going to be arguments to the surface shader pragma, uh, and it's going to generate code for me on the when Unity goes and compiles those shaders. But I don't have a spot to put an if def in. We can still do it, though, with a similar method, and that's, that's by abusing shader lods. Uh, if you've looked at the shader source, you might have seen this like lod number thing in here. I, honestly speaking, I've been coding in Unity for years. I had no idea what this meant until I had to look it up for this particular problem. But shader lods are a way for you to put multiple versions of your shader into a, into a single shader, and then at runtime, swap between the ones that you want to use. So here, I have exactly, exactly what I just described, uh, a runtime a real-time lit version of the shader and a version that's only lit by directional lights and light maps. And the one that is not lit is the one on the bottom. You can see there's a little no forward add argument in there in the shader. That's the thing that says opt me out from per pixel lighting. And the top one doesn't have that, which means it is real-time lit. So most of the time, I've baked all my lights. I don't have a lot of real-time lights in this game. Most of the time, I'm running the bottom one. But sometimes, I pick up a flashlight and instantaneously need to turn it on and at that point, I set the shader law to 200, and now it starts executing the, the top shader instead of the bottom shader, which is the one that is real-time lit. And, and, you know, it's cool. You can explore scary places with a flashlight. So these are sort of general approaches to, you know, making your game look cool in a way that doesn't cause uh, extra fill using, you know, systems that we would easily use on other platforms. But there's a couple of things that are built into Oculus Go that I'm also using that I want to tell you about. Uh, and then I'll, I'll finish this section up and we can, we can do questions. Oculus Go has this thing called fixed foveated rendering. Uh, and what this is, is it essentially will, will control the resolution of the eye buffer such that the center of it, where your eyes are going to be focused, is going to be the maximum resolution. And the edges around the periphery are going to be rendered at a lower resolution. And this is really cool because the periphery of your eyes, you, know, you can't really see a lot of detail there anyway. So there's not really a lot of reason to have a lot of high detail uh, pixel density in there. And by lowering the resolution of the, the periphery, we're actually filling a significantly smaller number of pixels. So our total GPU fill cost goes way down. We saw somewhere between a 20 and 30% improvement in overall GPU time for applications that were heavily GPU bound on, on fill. The way this works is, I don't know if you've seen uh, other foveation systems out there. Some of them you know, rely on eye tracking. Some of them rely on rendering a bunch of different little buffers and concatenating them together. This is completely different. Uh, it's always the same focal point. We, have no, we don't have eye tracking in this device. 
Uh, and because we have a GPU with a tiled renderer, what we're actually doing is we're actually going to the tiles that we know that are around the edges of the buffer and saying, you're going to render at a lower resolution. And so the ones that are closest to your visible space are at half resolution. The ones that are on the further edges are at a fourth or an eighth or a sixteenth. And so we're actually doing this at the sort of hardware chipset level. This is not a Unity-specific feature. Uh, and you, don't, you can actually, it doesn't, there's one line of code to turn it on, but you don't have to do anything in your game engine to use this. It's sort of a free improvement. It does incur uh, you know, some visual artifacting, but it's really, really hard to see. Like, this, this is the distorted version of an eye buffer, and this is at fixed foveated rendering on at its maximum amount. And I can't actually see it in this scene. If I put this on in the headset and I'm knowing what to look, like, look at, I still can't see it. If I zoom way in and I draw a line, you can kind of see that the corners of the eye buffer are lower resolution than the center. And that's this, that's this thing doing what it's supposed to do. But in the headset, it's nearly imperceptible. There is, uh, you know, there's a certain type of high frequency art, like particularly if you have high contrast text, that as it goes into the foveated area, will be more visibly sort of munged by it. And so because you can adjust this, you know, basically from frame to frame if you want to, you can adjust this at runtime. Our recommendation is essentially to turn it off when you're in your menu scenes. Your menu scenes are probably not performance bound anyway. And turn it on when you're, when you're in your 3D scene. This uh, feature allowed us to go from uh, 1024 with 1024 eye buffer, which was our initial target, all the way up to 1280 to 1280 without actually taking a performance hit. One last, one last Oculus Go specific feature. Uh, Oculus Go has this cool system called dynamic throttling. And what it does is it adjusts the performance of your CPU and GPU by, by adjusting like, the speed at which those chips run uh, dynamically and automatically as your software runs. So on a mobile headset, we care about battery life, and we also care about the total amount of heat that we're generating. Uh, Oculus Go is very good at venting heat, but we still like to clock the CPU and GPU down anytime we have the opportunity. We also don't want to impact your frame rate because, it, like I said at the top, like if you're not making 60 frames a second, uh, you are not going to have a good experience. Your customer's not going to have a good experience. So we have a system that will watch your CPU and GPU utilization. It'll watch your frame rate, and it'll make a guess if it thinks that you are about starting to spike. If you've, if you've entered the boss room and the boss is really expensive to render, it will notice that now your utilization has suddenly gone up and it will increase the performance of the GPU to compensate. And it'll continue to do this until you, until you, you know, uh, make frame rate. And after you make frame rate, it'll watch and it'll wait for your, for your utilization to drop back down before it clocks you back down. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, you kill the boss, the boss blows up and dies. Now you're just in an empty room and there's not that much going on. It will drop uh, the, the utilization, sorry, it will drop the, the, the speed of the GPU down so that you're not wasting battery life, you're not generating excess heat. This is automatic. Uh, you have a little bit of control over it. You can set a baseline if there's a point that you, you don't want to go below, you can set that. Otherwise, you just let it go. And it basically smooths everything out. Make sure that even if you have a spike, uh, you know, we're going to cover for you. Uh, after doing all this stuff, they're building our levels this way and, and using this sort of Oculus Go specific uh, technology, you know, we were, ended up with quite a lot of CPU headroom in particular and a little bit of GPU headroom too. And we put that into a lot of other stuff. Like once we could render the background properly, we're like, okay, well, let's make our characters look good. Uh, and let's have spatialized audio. Again, um, I thought they told you to get out of here. You know, and like, hey, it would be pretty cool if uh, you know you could talk to these guys and their Real faces would animate. That's old Rose. Why? You friend of hers? Or it would be cool if we could have a mirror uh, that you could walk by and see what you look like. And these are things that you know we're able to do because we have headroom, and we have headroom because we were efficient with the way we set up our scenes. Uh, because, uh, because we were sort of deciding, trying to design against this mobile target, we ended up sort of overachieving on the needs of the target, and now we had space to sort of add in other cool things. I have like two minutes, and I want to talk about one last thing. I mentioned real briefly that load times can be an issue on mobile headsets. In particular, loading, the, you know, Oculus Go is an Android device, so when you build for Oculus Go, you're building for uh, Android as a target, and your output is an APK. Loading scenes out of an APK on Android is really slow in Unity. It's particularly slow compared to other platforms. But you can get around that and improve your scene loading time by pushing all those scenes into an asset bundle. 
I don't actually need an asset bundle on any other platform. But for this device, what I did is I built this, this script that just goes through all the scenes. At, you know, I say like, oh, I want to build my Android build. And it goes through all the scenes and moves them into an asset bundle, builds the build, builds the asset bundle, and then moves all those things back into the main, the main scene. So I'm in, in the editor, it appears to be a monolithic application. When I make a build, I ended up with two files, the, the asset bundle and the, uh, and the APK. And as long as you use like the chunk-based compression um, asset bundle type, you can load that really significantly faster than you can out of the, out of the AK, APK proper. So for some of those really large levels, we were able to, to really reduce our load times by doing this. It's also important that you use ASTC texture compression. You shouldn't even consider any other type of texture compression on this device. Uh, and and in specific to optimizing scene load times, make sure that your uh, audio is all not set to decompress on load. Decompress on load is actually quite slow for this device. So if, uh, if you need audio, you want to be compressed to memory or, or streaming if it's long music or something. Great, so it runs really good on Oculus Go. We shipped, the device is selling pretty well. Uh, I think it launches all over the world pretty soon and it's available online today. The last thing I wanted to say is that in addition to Oculus Go, we also have this new headset uh, that we've been talking about called Santa Cruz. Uh, Santa Cruz is, is similar to Oculus Go, although it's significantly more powerful, uh, but it's similar in that it's an all-in-one headset, all the compute's built in. There's no tether, there's no computer, there's no phone. It all runs. The difference is, uh, unlike Oculus Go, it gives you six degree of freedom head tracking. So you can, I can walk across this stage and, and do that in VR. I also have hands, uh, controllers that do hand tracking very similar to Oculus Touch. And internally, although it's much faster, this device is very similar to Oculus Go. So all of the optimizations that I talked about today apply to Santa Cruz as well. And in fact, I did a test run of Dead Secret Circle on Santa Cruz, and we have like so much performance headroom now that I don't know what to do with it. I'm going to try to figure out where else to spend it. That is the end of my talk, and I wanted to thank everybody for coming today, but more importantly, I wanted to open up for questions. So there are, I have 10 minutes left. Uh, there's two microphones here and here, and if you have questions, please come up and ask. Thank you very much. Yes, here. Hey, uh, I've got a question about the um, occlusion algorithm that you've got in the pipeline. Sure. Could you use that style of algorithm for something with transparency in the scene? Yes. Yeah. So the, the transparency is tricky, um, but basically the way I do it is I actually do multiple passes. Okay. For a transparent object, you want to know what's behind it, but also where the object itself is. Like if you have a window, you need to both capture the pane of the window and whatever is on the other side. Okay. So I do a pass where all of the transparent objects are opaque to capture the objects themselves, and then I do another pass where all the transparent objects are, are gone, are just hidden to capture the things that are below. Thanks. And then I just union those lists. All oh, right, okay, thanks. Here. Hi. Oh. Whoa! Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, because this is all on a static scene, pre-built, is there anything you can do if you have to dynamically load the content and for example, a map or stuff like that. Do you have any tips or tricks on that side? Sure. I mean, you can dynamically load object maps that have already been pre-built this way. Yeah. Like, as long as you've baked all of the, the assets down, you could dynamically load this. I would say that dynamic loading, like in particular, like async scene loading, is quite slow on mobile devices. So if your goal was to make like a big streaming world where you're going to like pull these objects in as you go, your frame rate's probably not going to survive. Uh, just because the I.O. cost of loading those scenes is really high. But there's nothing to stop you from taking something that's been baked down like this, saving a little section of it out to an asset bundle and loading that dynamically. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, what about anti-aliasing technique, which you are using in your project, and uh, maybe you are using uh, upscaling? I'm sorry, so what was the question? Uh, what technique of anti-aliasing do you use? Oh, so anti-aliasing is, I should have mentioned that, anti-aliasing is nearly free on this device. Uh, I'm using 4X MSAA. It's provided by the hardware. It costs almost nothing. You can go higher, uh, but I don't think it's worth it. If you go to 8X, it would be more valuable to increase the, the target of your eye buffer. So this is buffer. standard uh, technique, hmm? yeah? Yes. Uh, do you use uh, upscale technique that are provided in uh, Oculus SDK? Uh, no, because it's not spreaded on mobile. That's actually going to be a type of technique that it requires another big copy because it looks like a full screen effect. Uh, and those are generally going to be slow. So what we would recommend is that you just use the standard effect that's built into the hardware. It looks quite nice. Uh, 
but it uh, also runs on Qualcomm chipset. It will run. No, I, I, I mean, you could totally use it, but it's going to be expensive. It's going to be significantly more expensive than the built-in version because you're going to end up doing a blit as part of that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Over here? Nope. Okay. Question over here? Uh, also, fusion cooling. What if you have an object that's not visible but maybe casts a shadow? Sorry, can you step closer to the mic? I could um, hear you. For occlusion cooling, what yes. if you have an object that's not visible, mm -hmm. but it casts shadows yes. that are visible? Sure. So if you have an object that is casting shadows but isn't otherwise visible, probably you want to make it visible. Um, probably what I would do is I would treat it the way I treat transparent objects, is I would make it visible to the occlusion system, but I'd call it transparent. So we would do a pass where we could see it so that we could pick up its mesh, and then we do a pass where it's gone so that we could see things that are behind it. Uh, and then I think that it, at runtime, how it actually renders is sort of irrelevant because what the occlusion calling system is doing is just picking mesh renders that should be turned on. Okay. How about shaders? When you use multi-compile, doesn't that destroy uh, batching? No. If with multi-compile, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to select from a number of shaders. Uh, actually, I'm guessing about how this works under the hood, but I suspect what you get is a is a large compiled shader, and Unity just jumps around in between which one it is actually using, so that you're binding the same thing every time. That's my guess. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to mention that we have office hours, and I, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but our our uh, if you walk by our booth over in the expo things and ask about office hours, there's time you can come by, and I, I'll be there for a little bit. There are a bunch of other Oculus folks that will be there who could sort of answer whatever questions you might have about our, our platforms, our hardware, this talk, or whatever. Okay, that tiled resolution thing that you showed uh, also works on the Gear VR? It does work. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it does not. It is something that we built with Qualcomm into the uh, driver and the chipset that is specifically in, uh, in Oculus Go, so it doesn't work on Gear VR. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, when you were stitching together your scenes, mm -hmm. how did you keep object references from breaking? Since you're uh, so when you stitch together the scenes, you can't have object references across your multi-scenes, right? Uh, you can if you build like a weak link uh, sort of soft pointer thing that I thought about doing, but in the end, we actually didn't need to do that. For the most part, what we did is... Um, we just made sure that all the objects were basically self-contained in their scenes. And then occasionally, I have cases where uh, there's an object that needs to know about post-combination, post like what's around it. Like, for example, there's a, I didn't talk about it today, but there's a dynamic occlusion system that picks out dynamic objects and hides them as, you're, as you get away from them. And what that thing does is it, it uses on validate to, to find all those objects. So after the... the the scene's been pushed down into one scene, and Unity will run on validate on all the objects, and it has an opportunity to find the references that it needs. Yeah. How's it going, Will? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Is there a way to check the actual performance of the of a, a program or a scene on the actual device? Yes, absolutely. So the device itself you can connect the Unity profiler to. Uh, we also provide some profiling tools on our website. There's a, there's a HUD you can put in here to watch your frame rate and stuff in real time in the headset. There's also a tool you can watch on your, uh, on your PC. And also, one of the things that I use the most is the uh, log that comes out of this device, like your, your log cat that, that comes out of this device, includes a, a uh, pretty detailed performance report that includes, like, your, your frame rate, uh, your GPU utilization. It also includes things like uh, the total number of frames that you've missed, also what speed your GPU and GPU are running at, what the temperature is, all kinds of information spit out to the log. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the talk. Yeah, thank you. Questions? Going once, going twice? All right, well, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it.